Today's video is mostly for beginners, but if you've been gardening for a while, you may learn a trick or two when it comes to seed starting. This is a total guide. It's gonna be a long video. We're gonna be going over if you wanna use a blocker, if you want to use classic seed cells, all the way to heat mats and potting soil choices and what seeds to start when, et cetera and so forth. So I want you guys to be successful in your gardening journey. So we're gonna put the effort in to make that happen. And one of the ways to make this happen is to choose your, I guess, weapon. <laughs> And your weapon choices are either something like this or something like this, or the Jiffy Pods would be the next one. The Jiffy Pods act very similar to this, and this is kind of a league on its own. What you wanna choose is kind of up to you. The blockers, if you will, the soil blockers are expensive, and these are cheap and reusable despite popular belief. Now, these you can use over and over and over again, and I've used mine over and over and over again for years. So at around a cost of $5 a tray, sometimes even less, sometimes more, depending on the durability of it, it you get your bang for your buck. This can run you somewhere between 25 to 50 to sometimes even 100, depending on how many cells you get. And you need more than one. So the small cell kit is great for flowers or small seed herb, anything that is smaller seedling wise, onions, leeks, garlic, seeds, you name it, will work well with the small cell. Now, if you wanted to, you could skip the small cell and actually just go straight to the four of the five block, which looks something like this. And this bad boy, you can actually utilize to block the bigger seeds. This would include things like tomatoes or peppers or okra or larger sized flowers, larger sized seeds. This would not work for pumpkins, squash, or any sort of vining plant, loofahs, unless you had the big block, which is I think $150 for just a single cell. I don't own that because I would never use it. So that is something to most definitely keep in mind. If you choose to use small blocker, you will need to purchase big medium blocker, this blocker, because the cells from this will fit into the cell of this, particularly if you have the inserts that go into this device that perfectly fit in these cells. So you will need both because eventually your herbs, your onions, your leeks, your small seed the flowers will need to be bumped up into something of this size. So if you get this, you will need this. If you have this, then you probably will be okay until it's time to pot up into a regular nursery pot or you get the giant blocker and then block into that. So total kit wise, if you were to get all three, it's gonna run you somewhere around $500. The next option is the Jiffy Pods. They look like this. You can get ones that are coated in nylon. You can get ones that are coated in cotton. The one you choose is completely up to you. What I will say is the nylon ones don't decompose. The cotton ones obviously do. Keep that in mind. If you wanna be pulling out nylon coated Jiffy Pod plugs for the rest of your life, then go with that option. I personally use those for years. Now. The one thing that both the Jiffy Pod and the Soil Blocker do have a benefit to is air pruning. And air pruning is a good thing once the plant is of proper size. It's not a good thing when the, the, the plant is little. Once it's of proper size, air pruning can help develop a stronger root system, a root system that breaks off and wise or separates ultimately making more roots, more root connections, more root hairs, etc., and so forth. So technically speaking, it can make a stronger plant than an enclosed container such as this one here. These are single cells. You can get clear ones, you can get black ones, and you can get ones of various different sizes. The smaller the cell, the shorter and the tinier, the better it is at capturing heat. So if you are using smaller seeds, such as little tiny flower seeds, 
or herbs, you may wanna go for a smaller celled tray because that will ensure that your heat mat is able to penetrate appropriately. If you have larger seeds or larger seedlings like tomatoes or eggplants or peppers, you may wanna go for a slightly larger and deeper cell such as this because then you won't have to bump up as soon. Keep in mind the heat won't penetrate the same, so you may wanna get a heat mat that has adjustable temperature controls to it, which will allow you to adjust the heat up or down depending on what temperatures you're looking for. Now I personally don't use the small cells very often and I will put my smaller seeds into a tray approximately this size and depth because I don't see any problems with the seeds that I've grown. If you're having issues though, it may be something to look at to diagnose the issue, particularly if you're doing some exotic flowers and that sort of thing. I personally don't do those, so I haven't run into that problem. Now, what I will say is with these cells is that the enclosed sides means more moisture retention. And then when you combine that with the fact that you have a cover pot or a, uh, a tray of some sort, that moisture tends to increase even more. And that is because it has nowhere to escape from. So what you could do is you could get trays that have holes in the bottom. This goes for both the soil blockers and for these kits here, depending on what results you're going for. I personally just leave the ones that don't have holes in my equipment arsenal because I can get lazy and forgetful when it comes to watering and bottom watering can be easier, particularly if you're not wanting to disrupt the soil surface because you have shallow grown seeds and disrupting the soil surface by watering on top can move the seeds around and it makes the whole situation kind of messy. So to avoid that, I do bottom water most of the time, unless I'm having fungal issues, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But regardless, what I use with both the blockers the Jiffy Pod technically already has it in it. And with these cells is a seed starting mix. I have a whole video on why you should choose a seed starting mix over a potting soil mix. The rules apply to all of the above. And that is why I choose to go for a seed starting mix. Now, the way that I prevent fungal growth or fungal issues on the soil surface and also just, um, excess moisture and dampening off is vermiculite, which I have somewhere here, right here. <laughs> Now the brand doesn't matter much. It's just the product called vermiculite. Vermiculite is an inorganic and by inorganic I mean just not living product. It is not asbestos. That is not true. <laughs> that is a common misconception. It is not asbestos. It is a, a thing on its own. I have a whole video on why it's not asbestos if you want to research that. But regardless, vermiculite works wonders. All you're going to do is sprinkle this on the top of your seed cells and what it does is it kind of breaks up the soil surface, which allows for airflow and ultimately prevents against fungal growth. I think it works beautifully for blocking and the Jiffy Pods and these cells. So I use it on all my seeds. The thickness in what you use is completely up to you. I go pretty heavy and Another tip is if I have smaller seeds, I will sprinkle them on the potting soil surface or the seed turning soil surface, and then I will just put the vermiculite on top rather than more soil. It works wonderfully, particularly with light sensitive seeds like lettuce, for example. So when it comes to utilizing either the soil blocker and or these cells, it's important to remember that compaction is key. Plants particularly seedlings, don't love air in their potting soil systems. So we want to make sure we're packing these cells nice and firm to ensure that there's little to no air movement or um, penetration. The other key here is that a properly packed cell, again, blocker or this tray, will mean that proper capillary action or absorption of water can take place, which is important if we're bottom watering and particularly important when we wanna ensure the entire soil is saturated. We don't want any dead spots and dead spots are simply areas in which air and lack of moisture exist, which seedlings, their roots will go completely around and avoid or completely not germinate altogether. So we wanna avoid that whenever possible. Now, when I first start my seeds, I will always bottom water and make sure everything's fully saturated. For about 24 hours, I will allow standing water to sit in the drip tray, again, regardless of what kit I'm using or what style I'm using. And then I will dump that out because that means now this is fully saturated. From there on out, you want to 
uh, potentially mist or sprinkle water on the top until the seeds begin to grow. Very rarely will you need to bottom water again unless you start getting very big seedlings and things are looking uh, particularly large. One way if you're new at this to avoid overwatering or to ensure your soil profile is properly saturated would be to get a clear cell or to get the blocker because the black ones won't allow you to see the entire soil profile. These two options will which can help you determine if it's time to water or not because potting soil seed starting mixes will change color. They'll go from very dark to very light and that's a great indication of when it's time to water. You will want to mist or sprinkle water on that soil surface once a day regardless of what you're doing and by sprinkle I mean very light sprinkle, very light spritzing just to keep that moisture up on that soil surface, which is where those seeds need to initially germinate. Okay, so we have our cells packed. We have our vermiculite on top. The next step is to get a cloche. Now, the cloches you will need, regardless of what seeds are starting and why. Seriously, it's really important to have these. These will help get, continue to keep the moisture elevated, which will help with germination and ultimately keeping your seedlings happy. This cloche can be removed from your seed starting setup once your seedlings have germinated and you're seeing one true leaf. So first you're gonna see cotyledons. They're two kind of disc-like leaves or weird looking leaves. They'll literally come up and out. The next leaf you're gonna see is your true first leaf. Once that appears out of the center, this can be removed and you can allow your trays to sit like this and water as needed. The next thing, while seeds are germinating, once they become alive and well, we do not wanna add fertilizer, organic or otherwise. This includes your potting soil mix. If you didn't watch the video on potting soil for a seed starting mix, one thing I will repeatedly say in that video is seed starting mixes do not have fertilizer. There's a reason for that. And it also includes liquid or granular fertilizer additions once everything's germinated. You want to wait until you get about three to four true leaves, meaning the two cotyledons don't count, the first leaf does, and then three after that. Once that appears, then you can use a liquid fertilizer. Until then, avoid it. You don't want to burn your seedling leaves, so just keep it out of the picture altogether. Now, you're probably thinking about lighting. When do I add it? You add it right away, immediately. Once you have everything seeded and watered and ready to go, you have your cloche on, you put your lights on. Now, this kit is convenient, and I did a review on this kit, and I think it's kind of cool for a beginner gardener. There are lights in the top of the cloche, this here, and it turns out they're powerful enough to germinate seeds just fine. This is about the distance you want to keep the light from your seedlings regardless of what seed you're starting. This can include flowers, onions, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, okra, pumpkins, you name it, regardless, about this far. It is around three to four inches away from the soil surface. This is where you will leave it until your seedlings get about halfway or about two to three inches tall. Then you wanna move it two to three inches up, two to three inches up, two to three inches up as the plant grows. The reason for this is we want our lights close enough to avoid something called legginess. If you've ever seen your seedlings look kind of floppy or you see very large internodes, meaning spacing between each leaf, this is a sign of lack of lighting. It can make weak seedlings, seedlings that just don't transplant well. So to avoid this, we want to keep our lights nice and close to our seedlings. And that means having adjustable lights. So many, many grow lights, this one not included, will have adjustability, meaning you can move the light up and down on string or on some form of rack. Utilize that because that is going to be your best friend. If you don't have a light that goes up and down on a string or some sort of apparatus, the next thing to consider is actually a dimmer. So dimming the light up or down depending on that plant's growth. Now, if you're unsure, completely confused as to how much light there is, if there's enough and you're worried about it, get a plant sensor. That's the only thing that can help you with this. It's a lot of trial and error. If you're noticing legginess, floppy, long inner nose, you don't have enough light. If you notice the leaves are really folding down, you've got patchy whiteness or patchy yellowness or just a weird growing plant, it might be in too intense. If you just want to avoid that confusion altogether, a plant sensor would work. Earth One plant sensor is the plant sensor I helped to design. You could utilize this. It'll also tell you actually when to water too. So regardless, 
that is what you want to do. Now, everything's planted. You're going to leave everything probably for like a month or two, if not longer, depending on what cell size you went with. After that, you're going to start seeing roots poking out the bottom and poking out versus trailing or two different things. You want to wait till the roots are literally going into this bottom catch dish before you do something called bumping up. Bumping up simply means moving it out of single cells into your classic nursery pots. Now this can be yogurt containers, this could be sour cream containers, this could be actual professional nursery pots. What you use does not matter. You can get peat style ones, you could even get a coconut quarter or peat based ones. It, 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 you make them on a newspaper, regardless. I have a garden guide. Grab the garden guide. The garden guide will tell you everything you need to know or everything you would need to grow plants. Now, these ones that have been bumped up can be fertilized officially. So you can use a liquid fertilizer. That would be my preference. Uh, but I would still stick with a seed starting mix, maybe a potting soil, depending on what your preference is. If you have it indoors, I would stay away from potting soil though, because potting soil more often than not has organic compounds like vermicast or compost or manure, which can result in gnats and fungus and just bugs, grossness. If you can avoid it, avoid it indoors, try a seed starting mix. From this point, you may want to choose them to move into a greenhouse or you may want to continue to grow them indoors. You're going to need the lighting. You're going to need the infrastructure to do this. So do keep that in mind. When you look at lighting, it will give you a footprint of what this light can fulfill. So for example, the square ones will say five by five feet, for example. If you have a space for five by five feet, that is a great option for a light. Just keep in mind, you need the infrastructure to make it happen. From there, you're gonna wanna eventually harden these plants off, meaning putting them outside for periods of time. I have a whole video on that. If you don't wanna harden them off, I have a whole video on how to get your plants outdoors without hardening them off. I swear it works, I'm using recycled materials. It works wonders, something else to try. And then you're off to the races, you should be good to go. So, I hope this helped you. If you need a better understanding on what to grow when, then I would hit the subscribe button. I do monthly videos on what seeds to start in what month. Check that out, please. It'll help you give you an idea of what seeds to start when. Again, the later you start the seeds, the better, especially for a beginner. Trust me, it'll be less of a headache if you wait. That means tomatoes and peppers can be started in March. They don't have to be started in February. I promise you, you are not behind. You are right on schedule. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, thumbs up, Comment down below how long you've been seed starting your own seeds or if you still buy from nursery. Nothing wrong with that either. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.